want you to stay at Acts 17, as that's where we're going to be looking today, taking one last look at the Sermon on Mars Hill. This is, uh, give you some context, we're in Athens, Greece, second missionary journey. We've traveled down the, uh, the eastern coast of um, the Mediterranean, but over in Europe uh, and Macedonia, where God called Paul to go. Uh, we've been to Thessalonica, we've been to Philippi, then Thessalonica, then Berea, now down to Athens. Athens was the capital of Greece and full of gods, full of uh, idolatry. It was said that there were 30,000 idols in Athens in Paul's day. Uh, and even Christ, uh, not Christian, but satirists said it was easier to find a God in Athens than it was to find a man. And so that's the setting for this sermon. Paul goes in, sees the idols. He is pr uh, provoked in his spirit at the idolatry because Romans 1, he believes that glory belongs only to the one true God and should not be bestowed upon things made with man's hands. And so he begins to preach the gospel. He preaches it in the synagogue. He preaches it in the marketplace. Anywhere he can get a crowd, he is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the one true God. And so these philosophers come up to him and they say, uh, we want to hear more about this new thing that you are presenting. Verse 21 says they chase the new. They just want a, a new idea. They want to debate on new things. They want to find out more. It's, it's a, a very exhausting Ferris wheel to be on where you're chasing the next new thing, and we have people still caught up in that today, instead of just surrendering to uh, the scriptures and holding on to that as truth. But as they sat there and they listened to him or dialogued with him, it says that they took him up on the Areopagus, and that's where we find ourselves in the sermon that James just read. Uh, the sermon that Paul preached on the Areopagus, this was a small hill northeast of the city that was the highest court in the land. Philosophers went up on top of this hill and they sat in a circle and they debated over things. Only the most important topics got discussed on the Areopagus. You said, but it's his sermon on Mars Hill. And we've explained it a couple of times that uh, the Greeks called the god of war, Ares, the Romans called him Mars, and so whether you want to call it the Areopagus or Mars Hill, you're referring to the same place, and it's where Paul was put out in the center of these philosophers and said, tell us more. If you look at, uh, draw your attention to verse 19, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. And so this is what the sermon is in response to. What do these things mean about this one true God and about this resurrection? Because the, the Epicureans didn't believe in life after death. So this idea of a resurrection was rather confusing or intriguing to them, and they wanted to hear more about it. And so what Paul does is Paul presents God for who he really is, how big he really is, and, and basically describes him as bigger than any other God that you have represented in Athens. This God is so much bigger. He is so much more worthy of your worship. He is the one true God. And Paul begins with an analogy or an illustration that would have been relatable to his audience. So look at verse 23 where... Uh, Pastor James read, it says that he was walking around in the midst of 30,000 idols and he finds one idol that has this inscription on it that says, to the unknown God. All right, so he takes this and he says, okay, I'm going to use this as, as my starting point and I'm going to present a God that they do not know, yet they acknowledge his existence and I'm going to describe how he can be known. He is a knowable God, and Paul does that in verse 23. Not only is he a knowable God, but he is also creator of all things and sovereign over all things, if you look at verses 24 through 26. We've covered that as well. And then we, had, we spent a week on verse 27 uh, as Paul described this God as being both transcendent and imminent at the same time. It, it still blows my mind to recognize or to try to fathom that I worship a God that is so big that he cannot be contained by space or time, yet he's so close that I can call him my heavenly father. Does that just uh, overwhelm you today with gratitude? He is transcendent, but he is also imminent. 
And then last week we looked at verses 28 and 29 where Paul referred to him as a heavenly father through the person of Jesus Christ, which brings us today to our last look at this sermon and where all sermons ought to lead to the person of Jesus Christ because it is in him that we find salvation. Amen? In Jesus Christ alone. So verses 30 and 31 is where we're going to spend our time this morning. I want you to see the gospel that's presented here uh, in uh, following after who God is, who, what his character is, what he has provided, what he has power over, how strong and, and, and big he is. And then in verse 30, Paul speaks of repentance. He says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So I think it's important for us today to define some terms. All right, Paul says a lot in these two verses. Whether this is a a concise recording by Luke of Paul's sermon or not. We know we have what the Holy Spirit intended for us to have in God's Word. And so uh, it is complete in the message that God wanted to reveal to us. But what is Paul saying when he says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked? Let's just look at each term. Uh, Truly these times. What times? You just have to look back one verse to figure out what times. Verse 29 says, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. So the the times that Paul is talking about is times of idolatry, times of taking God's divine nature and trying to cram him into things made by man's hands. You cannot do that. It is these times that God has overlooked. Uh, These times of ignorance, what does ignorance mean? Uh, Ignorance literally means uh, unknown. And so these times, what are so upsetting about these times? Romans 1, these are times of changing the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, Romans 1, 23. But it's times of ignorance, of not knowing. Verse 23 I uh, found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, therefore the one you worship without knowing. The one you worship in ignorance. He is the one that I'm introducing to you. So that's what Paul means when he says, truly, these times of idolatry, worshiping in ignorance, God has overlooked. Now, we need to address this word overlooked as well. Because if you're not careful, you will... Uh, try to take this at face value and say that God excused, that God condoned, that God ignored, and none of those can be true because sin cannot be excused. Sin cannot be condoned. Sin cannot be ignored. So that cannot be what God is, what Paul is meaning when he says God overlooked. So what does that word overlooked mean? It means... To choose not to interfere with judgment. So I'm going to give you a little little illustration. To choose not to interfere with judgment. Uh, My wife and I, we use discipline as a form of instruction to get our children to obey. All right, The Bible tells you to do that. If you don't do that, you are disobeying as a a Christian parent. Uh, Just a little side note. Uh, But we use discipline as a form of instruction in order to bring about obedience in our children. And there are times when myself as the father could look upon the behavior of my children and see that they are doing something that warrants discipline and choose not to interfere for a certain period of time while the behavior is being committed knowing that I am going to carry out that discipline, just not yet. All right, whatever my purpose might be, maybe I want them to see the error of their way, I want them to experience the consequences of why Daddy told them not to do this or that. Whatever the case might be, I'm going to be patient, and I'm going to overlook for a time, while the behavior is being carried out, 
but the discipline will follow. At no point in that process has dad expressed his condoning, excusing, or accepting of the disobedient behavior. Right? So you can see how God, for a period of time, can overlook this season of idolatry without condoning it. He has just chosen for a period of time not to interfere with special judgment. And that's what that word overlooked means. does not mean God condoned. It means God was patient. Let me tell you something here today. You better be thankful for God's patience. Because patience equals mercy. You know what a, a lack of patience would be? To send you to hell the moment you commit your first sin. Right? And, and even before that, because we're born in sin. Uh, Psalm 51.5. And so mercy is him being patient. And we're going to see in a moment what that patience leads to. But we need to be very grateful for his patience, for his mercy. Thankful today that God has seen fit to overlook for a season the sin that has been committed. Turn to Romans chapter 3. You just have to go to uh, the right one book. Go to Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 21. I want you to see uh, this patience at work leading into what Paul is about to say to the Athenian idolaters. Uh, Verse 21 of Romans 3 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, that is a a satisfaction, that is an appeasement of the sin debt and the separation between man and God uh, by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, all right, here's the patience, in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Why? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right, let me share with you what that means. In order for a holy, righteous God to remain holy, righteous, and just... If he states that a certain crime deserves a certain punishment and he is faced with a person who has committed that crime, what must happen in order for that judge to remain just? The punishment must be enacted for the crime. So how is a just judge able to remain just if all sin is punishable by death? And Romans 3.23 says... All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but yet we're not all dead. That's not just. He just excused a punishment. No, he didn't. He was patient in the process because his plan was to take out the just punishment on his own son instead of taking it out on you. And we need to be thankful for the mercy and the forbearance that he overlooked for a time the sin that we committed, but he took the weight and the price and the wrath and the judgment out on his son for that sin. So that time of ignoring is over, right? We either turn to Christ and recognize that he has paid that punishment for us in the mercy and grace of God, or we pay that punishment ourselves in an eternity in hell. God has now interfered with the sins of man by taking out his judgment for that sin on his son for those who place their faith and trust in Christ. It says in Hebrews 2.17, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren. Jesus had to become man. He had to take on flesh that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation, satisfaction for the sins 
of the people, to pay the price, to satisfy the debt, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, to take on sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Right? That great exchange. And so this time of overlooking has passed. Sin has not been overlooked. Christ has paid the punishment for that sin. And those who do not have a relationship with Christ, next verse, will pay that punishment themselves. So the next thing that that Paul says in verse 30, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. To turn from their sin, uh, to turn from the sin that they're committing, to turn toward God in salvation. You cannot pursue sin and God because they are in two opposite directions. All right? Even though some of you may feel like you are going in two opposite directions sometimes, it is not humanly possible to go in two opposing directions simultaneously. All right? It doesn't take rocket, rocket science. Sin and God are two opposing directions. You cannot go in the direction of sin and be going in the direction of God. You must turn from that sin in repentance in order to go the direction that God is commanding you to go. So there is a, there is a turning. He has called all men everywhere to repent. Turn to Titus chapter 2. If you'll just go to the right, if you hit Hebrews, back up two books. And you'll be at Titus. Look at Titus chapter 2. I want you to see an example of repentance. And I want you to pay specific attention to the, the redirection, the replacement, the turning. It's not enough to just veer off course because then all you're doing in that case is sin swapping. You're maybe, uh, you, you gave up fulfilling the flesh this way, now you're fulfilling it this way. That's just kind of a detour. No, what is commanded in Scripture is to do a complete U-turn, to turn from that sin, the energy, the resources, the motivations, everything that was invested in pleasing the flesh is now surrendered to pleasing God. And of course, we know that that pivotal point is salvation, a work that we can't do ourselves. Uh, We're talking about fruits of that salvation. But it says in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Listen to the turning. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, all right, first direction, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So those are two different directions. Uh, Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Turn from your sin. Continue no longer in it. 1 John 1, 9 says, If you'll confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You think if if that's true, the opposite is also true. A lack of confession, a lack of repentance involves a lack of forgiveness, a lack of cleansing, full of unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that, uh, and I'm covering things that we cover on a regular basis as a church family, that your forgiveness is not based on your performance to turn and and seek it. Excuse me. (coughs) Seek it. It's based on Christ's ability to give it through the work of the cross. But certainly if you've received it, it'll be evident in your behavior. And you're turning from that sin. You're you're going toward God. You're seeking to glorify and honor Him. So repentance is the pathway uh, that's leading to salvation. Rejection is the pathway that's leading to judgment. So that brings us to the next part of verse 31. Because He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. I want to get you to turn back to Romans. Romans chapter 2. So not not far from our location at Acts 17. Uh, Same person, the Apostle Paul, uh, wrote Romans that is being recorded by Luke here in Acts 17. 
And I want you to see what is said of this topic, of the coming judgment that is due our sin. Romans 2, look at verse 4. And Paul speaks of God's patience here as well. It says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Let me just stop right there and say we need to be incredibly thankful that through God's patience we were given an opportunity to repent. Instead of being judged for the sin we have committed, With no patience, God has had forbearance upon our sin and has taken the price of that sin out on His Son and has granted us the ability to repent of the sin that we have committed. Look at verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they're going to receive indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. What is Paul saying there? He's saying those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ are going to be rescued from the coming judgment. Those who have not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, they have not turned to Him, they have not repented of their sin, they are going to face the coming judgment. That is very simply put. It says that this judgment will be in righteousness. Not that we need to rescue God's character from anything that he has said he was going to do. But we need to recognize that this judgment is completely and perfectly righteous judgment. Which means he is completely right in carrying it out. It is appropriate for God to carry out judgment on those who have sinned. And those who live in opposition to the life that Christ has redeemed us to live. It goes on in verse 31 to say there has been a day appointed. That means the day is fixed for this judgment to happen. And not only is the day fixed, but the judge is fixed by the man whom he has ordained. So you got a a coming judgment that is inescapable for those who are apart from Christ, you got a coming day that this judgment is going to happen, and you have a coming judge that is going to carry out this judgment, and that judge has been identified. All right, we'll, we'll hold that for a moment uh, in verse 31 uh, of the identification. He has been identified through the resurrection. But what does the word world mean in verse 31? There's an appointed day in which he would judge the world. World literally means everyone in the world, everyone of the world, no exceptions. You want to talk about God's patience, when is the last time this has happened? It's been over 3,000 years ago, right? What does it sound like if I say to you, there is coming a judgment that is going to affect every living thing on the earth, and the only ones who will escape this judgment are those who have taken refuge Sounds like the flood, right, of Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6, 5 through 7 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and that he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, Creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. You ever uh, get down and throw a little pity party on on how uh, terrible things are today and say, oh, times are worse than they've ever been. I think Noah would disagree with you. Right? There's enough people in this room today to disprove that things are not as bad as they've always been. Because you got one man and under him one family that finds grace in the sight of God, the rest have 
have turned away. Uh, Genesis 6, 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So here's a, an easy connection that we can put in what happened in Genesis 6 to what Paul is presenting to the Athenians. And that easy connection is just as the only salvation from the judgment of the flood was found in the ark, the only salvation that will be found in the coming judgment will be found in Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want people on that ark with me. And so that compels me to evangelize. It compels me to do exactly what Paul is doing here, to speak of Christ, right? To share with them the rescue, the redemption, the propitiation, the satisfaction, the atonement that exists in what Christ did for us on the cross. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. If, you've been, uh, if you haven't been coming to Wednesday nights, we're studying the letters to the Thessalonian church and we're transitioning from the first letter to the second. Uh, but I want to read from that first chapter this morning to kind of highlight what I just said using Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all bounds to, abounds toward each other. So basically you are living out, you are bearing fruit of a redeemed life. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now listen to this. Verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. It is right for God to punish those who persecute his bride. And just as it is right for him to bring judgment on those who are against his bride, it is right for him to bring grace and salvation upon those who are part of his bride. He is right in doing that. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest, with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So this is that coming judgment Paul told the Athenians about in Acts 17. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed, therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you something? Judgment does not need to be removed from the gospel. You want to know why? Because judgment is part of what makes the gospel such good news. You've been rescued from that. And when we are sharing the gospel, we don't just need to share about all of the things that are available in Christ. We need to share about what happens for those who are not in Christ. That's part of the gospel. It's what makes it good news. It says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. And then listen to this. Even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's why the gospel is such good news. When we, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we, we take a cup, and it has juice in it that symbolizes Christ's blood, and we remind ourselves that, that God's wrath was completely swallowed up on the cross of Calvary, right? That's good news 
for those who are in Christ. Got a little funny story to tell you right quick. Uh, two of my boys, a couple of years back, were riding on a four-wheeler with one of our deacons, Craig Craddock. And Craig Craddock was going, and I love Craig, so don't, don't take this as any a slight on him. I'm getting to a point. Uh, Craig was going rather fast on this four-wheeler. And my two boys are hanging on the back. And one of them says, Mr. Craig, Mr. Craig, we need to slow down. We might die. And Craig says, well, that's okay. If we die, we know where we're going. And my son says, well, you might. We're lost. We'll go to hell. <laughs> and, so, and so Craig slows down. And he calls me. And he says, Brian, I'm just grateful for a pastor who teaches the whole gospel to his children. <laughs> so I thought of that when I think about we can't remove judgment from, which if we carry that story out longer, the two boys that were on that four-wheeler are now saved, praise God, uh, and rescued from going to hell if they wreck on a four-wheeler. We're thankful for that. But Jesus has delivered us from the wrath to come, and that's good news. And that wrath is what Paul speaks of at the end of verse 31. Look to the one whom God raised from the dead to be rescued from the wrath to come. Look at the end of verse 31. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. If you go all the way back up to verse 22 with how Paul started the sermon, what did he say? I have perceived, men of Athens, that you are very religious. You want to know something that sets Christianity apart from all other religions? We serve a risen Savior. Our Savior is alive. And because He is alive, He has been singled out as the one. Not a way, as the way that God has provided rescue from the coming judgment. He's also the appointed judge that will carry out that judgment. God has given us complete assurance that Jesus is the only way, He is the only one who can rescue you. God singled Him out by raising Him from the dead as He fully satisfied the wrath that God had toward the sins of His people. Our Savior lives. John 14, 6, Jesus says of himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you and the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then Peter in Acts 4, 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So what do you do when you speak of judgment to a, a lost world? You are able to single out only one way known to man to escape that judgment. And it's through the person of Jesus Christ. It's part of sharing the gospel. Now getting to the end of verse 31, we might be tempted to say, Paul, you didn't land the plane. Paul, you didn't close the deal. Paul, you didn't give him an opportunity to respond. Can I just tell you something? Before we read verses 32 and 33. If you have presented God for who he really is, which Paul did. And you have presented Jesus as the only way to escape the coming judgment and get to this God for who he really is. Then you have presented the gospel. And if you have presented the gospel, you have done your obligation. It is not your responsibility, nor is it your capability to save anyone. So I want to remind you of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. I am the messenger. I am to portray the message or convey the message of the gospel. I am to introduce people to Jesus, but I am not the one that saves them. God is. And so we don't know, I say all that to say, we don't know if the transition between verses 31 and 32 was Paul getting interrupted. You know, they, 
it was the resurrection they wanted to hear most about to begin with. And so Paul finally got to saying something about the resurrection. And they could have jumped up and interrupted him at that part. And they were like, ooh, that's what we want to hear about. Right? And, and Paul says, is that all you've been listening to? Uh, and, and he leaves. But it says in verses 32 and, and 33 that when they heard him say something about the resurrection of the dead... Some mocked him, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And Paul departed from among them. He left the Areopagus. We know in chapter 18 he went to Corinth. That's the next stop on the missionary journey. But to see the Lord work, look at verse 34. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. People got saved. Paul presented God for who he really is. He spoke of a coming judgment that is due the sins of man. He spoke of one way to escape that judgment and people got saved. So I want to close just by painting a reality for you that, that all of us fit into. And that is, you've heard me say it before, but there's only two types of people in the world. Just two. There are those who know God, and there are those who do not know God. That's it. If you will hold to that, then your interactions will be based off of those two categories. It'll be brotherly fellowship or evangelism. That's our responsibility. Linking arms with brothers and sisters in Christ, evangelizing the lost while we're here on earth representing Christ. I heard one commentator this week that I was, I was reading said, there are the saints and there are the ain'ts. That's the only two categories that exist. You're either saved or you're not. Those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are those who have rejected Him. Those who have repented of their sins and turned to God in obedience are those who are still lost in their sin. Those who are mercifully rescued from the coming judgment are those who will rightfully face the coming judgment. That's the only two categories. And so then that leaves us with a question that I pray the Holy Spirit is, is grinding into our hearts today of which category am I in? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So do you know Christ? Do you not know Christ? Have you produced fruits of knowing Him through repentance and faith? Or are you lost in your sin and going the opposite direction? I urge you today, today is the day of salvation. Examine yourself. That the Holy Spirit would show you which category you are in. I want to give you something else. We're not going to turn there for the sake of time. But if, if there's a particular sin, maybe, that you're battling with today. And you know that God's requirement is that you repent of that sin. That that is the, that is the fruit of regeneration that if you are saved you will not continue in that sin and that you repent of it and you're saying I, I want to do that I want to be obedient in repentance I want to encourage you in your own time today to take that sin and go to Psalm 51 there is a beautiful recording of a prayer of repentance in King David's life there's no excuses that are made there's a surrender of acknowledging of his guilt. There's an acknowledging that all the sins that I have committed and all the people that it has affected, I recognize that I have sinned against you and you alone. And I need your forgiveness. I need you to restore to me the, the joy of my salvation. If that's, if that's kind of where you're at, go and read Psalm 51. Maybe even the Holy Spirit will compel you to make that a personal prayer of yours to the Lord, that he would bring brokenness and and repentance and forgiveness and restoration. What a beautiful process that is that God can lead you in.